I'm uh, surprised to see so many faces in here. Um, the theme is more application oriented. When I was preparing the presentation, I thought I should apply for the least technical content of all the conference talks award. So we're not going to dig deep into Ansible playbooks, programming details and everything, but I'll give you an outline of the architecture we developed and the reasoning behind it and our experience with it. The agenda is not a table of contents, so I don't have any slides with all of this as a title. This gives you a rough outline of what I'd like to talk about. And this is introduction of uh, our company and what we do, the challenges we face in hosting, our first attempt at solving these challenges, and then why we changed from an NOBSD setup to a jail-based architecture, what we do now in our data center, and what we like to do in the future. I myself have been working in IT since 1986, and my Unix endeavor started with discovering Minix in 1989. And ever since I uh, took on FreeBSD in 93, I haven't looked back and never regret regretted it. I'm currently in charge of network and data center operations at punk.de. And I'm a proud member of the team MOPS, the Magnificent Operators. We have three guys who are originally operator type people and one fresh colleague who is a developer. Um, the fun part is that MOPS to all the German speakers means a pug, that smallish kind of dog. So we have an unofficial team logo that looks like this. Um, does that mean that we do DevOps now? Well, yes and no. I think DevOps must be the most misused IT term of the last year or two. Uh, when managers say DevOps, they mean one of two things most of the time. Either they mean no ops, so the developers do the operator's job. <laughs> But there's a reason why people like me are still around and why it's a profession to manage a data center. Or they mean infrastructure as code and just slap the DevOps label on it. And I'm fine with that because this is what we're trying to do and what I'm going to show you what we do. Uh, this is the agenda of our entire team for the last couple of years. Punk.de, the company was uh, founded in 96 started as an ISP. Well, internet lease lines are a commodity nowadays, even for companies. So now we're hosting web applications and we have two development teams for hosting roughly 100 servers. We are a RIPE member, DNIC member, all the necessary requirements. As I said, three teams and all in all about 30 people. Challenges when hosting, as I see it, are availability, performance, cost, and manageability. And uh, manageability is often underestimated, but it's the key point, in my opinion, that decides about the scalability of your entire data center. How many people do you need to manage a couple of servers, and how far can you scale? We now have 100 at the current location. We can place about 300. But what if we want to scale to a thousand or even more? Hopefully we will get there one day. And we don't necessarily want to increase the number of employees tenfold. Okay, one challenge when it comes to server management. How do you do updates? Well, I never do updates because I never change a running system, right? And how do you do backup? I mean, nobody wants backup. Everybody just wants restore. I don't get it. So, as our first try to get a better management platform for servers, we just tried to tackle the individual machine, and we used a NanoBSD-based setup. NanoBSD was developed by uh, Paul Henning Kamp for embedded systems. And uh, the servers we used had two hard disks. You may know the device names from FreeBSD. And what we did was we put a uh, John Mirror on top of that, on those hard disks, now it even gets technical. 
And on this mirror, we put a couple of partitions. And uh, these partitions are uh, part of the NanoBSD architecture. We have two slices that are for the operating systems and all the uh, installed packages. So this is the entire root file system over here. And we have an alternate slice with more or less the identical software that is not active. And you can update the system by simply using DD to copy a pre-built image to the inactive slice, reboot into the other one, you can easily roll back, and so on. The persistent customer data goes into the third slice, as goes the persistent config data that you need. And the magic of NanoBSD will copy it over to ETC uh, at boot time. Works quite well. Advantages, core OS and packages are all read-only. So there's one less thing to worry about. Even if somebody would have root access, he cannot build, say, a Trojan into SSHD or everything, a keylogger, stuff like that. The partition is not modifiable. If you raise the secure level of your system, you cannot remount it at runtime, so you're secure in that regard. You get atomic updates. So hopefully, if your build procedure is OK, you have everything in one consistent state fitting together, so no missing libraries and everything. You get one system that you know will work. You can roll back by simply activating the previous active partition. Uh, sometimes that's not quite true. For example, when you upgrade from FreeBSD 7 to FreeBSD 8, the metadata for the John Mirror module gets updated on disk, so you cannot go back. <laughs> but most of the time you can. And if you do it right, you have identical software for all your servers. Yeah. But there are also some drawbacks. Um, the first one was homemade. We did not, at the time, automate image creation, so it was still a manual process, installing the packages from ports into the new NanoBSD image. Sometimes people made mistakes. We had inconsistent software versions, stuff like that. Then, uh, caused by the architecture, we need a reboot of the entire machine for each update. And we cannot easily install additional software after a machine has been provisioned with a certain set of software without going through all the process, build a new image and everything. And sometimes a customer calls in and says, well, I need PHP module foo. So how do you go about that? Uh, yeah, And we have one PHP, one MySQL version and everything for the entire machine. So if you have a shared environment like Apache vHost or whatever, you cannot have different PHP versions for different customers on that very same system. We addressed some of these uh, with the knowledge we acquired during the last couple of years. Uh, about infrastructure as code and everything. We uh, dug deep into Vagrant. So now NanoBSD image creation for our legacy service is a simple Vagrant app. And then an up-to-date image will uh, come out of that after three or four hours coffee break. No problem, you can run it on a server, triggered by Jenkins, what, whatever. Go the entire continuous delivery way. It works really great. And we build our own Poudrier to uh, build our own packages, which is an absolutely fantastic tool. <laughs> One of the cornerstones when people ask me why FreeBSD, I always say they give you infrastructure, not product. And Poudrier is definitely one of those infrastructure things. So what do we want from the new architecture? We want an even better isolation of customers on the same machine something virtual machine-like. We want individual configuration per customer. And we want a couple of instances on one piece of hardware, faster updates, and everything fully automated. Not that surprising altogether. That has been the talk of the last years in data center management and hosting and architecture. So we have two guys that are currently, I think, the big kahunas here. Been to the OpenStack Summit in Atlanta, and uh, so a private cloud with all hypervisor-based architecture seems to be the thing to do. Maybe, or that one. 
I must admit, they have a cute mascot. So it's all Docker. You build it, you run it, containers, yeah. 100% buzzword compliant, but uh, didn't fit us that well. So why not? Why not a hypervisor? Yeah? One VM per customer. We decided against hypervisors because it would increase our workload multifold because each VM is a separate system. You cannot easily dig into the VM's file system from the outside to do updates of 100 VMs at the same time. You have to treat each VM as a separate host, even if you go uh, automating stuff with Ansible or Chef.io or everything. Essentially, on this, wait a minute, let's go back. Here we have 16 machines to manage, although it's only four pieces of physical hardware. Then you have a little bit of overhead, not that much, given how powerful today's machines are, that's not really a problem. But you cannot smoothly over-provision, like in a symmetric multiprocessing environment, memory and CPU in a hypervisor, but you have fixed resource sets for each VM. And then which virtualization technology to pick? Um, when VMware came up to be the big guys, I've been talking to them at every CBIT fair, year after year, and asked them, okay, please show me. You, you always tell me you can save so much money by employing VMware. Okay, just do the math for me. You, you're the sales guy, you do it. And they just couldn't, because uh, their math depends on a lot of servers that are running Windows-like operating systems and are mostly idle. And <laughs> like, in enterprises, of course, you have your Active Directory, you have your database server, you have your Exchange server, and if you can fit all of them on one machine, then you're saving, of course. For a data center where I rent a dedicated piece of hardware to a customer, and the customer wants this precise amount of CPU, RAM, and everything, that doesn't scale if you count the cost of VMware licenses on top. Plus, hardware that is 10 times as powerful as a standard one unit server with a single socket or two sockets is most of the time more than 10 times as expensive. So not that much scalability in our case. And storage is either fast or cheap. Yeah, I didn't forget reliable, but reliable is not an option. I mean, leaving out reliable, you don't want that, don't you? Okay, so. What about that container guy, that cute blue whale? I must admit I have a cute logo. Uh, well, no. <laughs> um, at least that's what uh, even Docker proponents and people working in the field keep telling me. They say, if you want to SSH into a container, you're doing it wrong. It's all about orchestrating containers from the outside, and you don't do that. Okay, why don't you do it? Because it's supposed to work like this. What, what, you have to look at virtualization technologies uh, with a question, what precisely does the technology actually virtualize? So if you have a hypervisor, it's like IBM VM back in the 70s. It virtualizes the entire machine. You get N machines instead of one, and you put an operating system kernel, bootloader, Hey, VMware even has a BIOS setup for their machines that you can get into. Yeah? You're virtualizing machines and you can run arbitrary kernels. That's the plus sign. You can run Windows, you can run Linux, you can run FreeBSD. Okay. When we have jails, which is much more lightweight, we essentially virtualize slash spin slash init. So a jail is just a file system tree starting at some top level directory. And then we can bootstrap an entire operating system with everything but the kernel. So we start at another init process and then go all the way to, from etc RC all the way down until all the services are started. And Docker actually aims to just virtualize a single process, just one thing, an Nginx server, MySQL database, MariaDB, Elasticsearch, what have you. And it happens to be that our customers are of the style that they want the full stack on one machine with a persistent storage and they can SSH into it. Um, but we as operators want to give them 
don't want to give them their hypervisor-based fully emulated virtual machine because that's too expensive. So we meet precisely here um, in the jails. This is a rough summary. They want the semantics of a VM. They want to feel alone on their system. And we want fast provisioning, easy updates, and low cost. Okay, jails are at an advantage here because they look like a VM to the customer, they have low overhead. Uh, contrary to Docker, they don't require a separate server process. And uh, now it's getting really beautiful because from the view of the host system, all the processes inside the jails are just regular system processes. And all the jails file systems are just regular system file systems. So you can, with local file system semantics, always touch and twiddle and tweak all the stuff that is in the jails from within the host system, which you cannot do either with Docker nor with a VM. So, and the last innovation is virtualized network stack, which is absolutely great. And if you know your stuff, you can do whatever you like. I'll get into the architecture a little bit later. This virtualized network stack, vImage and FreeBSD, introduces the ePair interface. ePair is essentially a virtual patch cable. And one end of the cable happens to be inside the jail as an interface that you can if config, up, down, IP address, IPv6, everything. And the other end happens to be an interface in the host system. And every packet that the jail processes right into that interface happens to come out at the host side and the other way around. It's got its own MAC address, so you can bridge, root, and network address translate it to your heart's content. We use bridges to connect those interfaces. I'll show you the architecture. We have a couple of customer jails. The ePair interface is called VNet0 in, in all of the jails. And then we have a bridge interface, which is connected to the physical interface of the host machine, which is connected to the wire. And the beauty is you don't need to do it that way. Instead of the physical interface, you can use a cloned loopback interface instance, for example, assign a private IP address to that, and then use your host system's routing and netting capability to do whatever you like. You can create multiple of these in every jail. You can connect them to VLAN tagged sub-interfaces of this. You can use a jail as a router and whatever you desire. It just works. And if you know networking basics, it's really, really, really straightforward. Okay, the shameless marketing plug. We called the new product the Pro Server. This is how we address the customers. What is so by developers, for developers uh, with that product? It is that we try to put all the technologies in there that modern web applications need for a certain set of web applications. So we're still PHP based. Uh, some people would challenge the modern when it comes to PHP. But uh, we put Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, MariahDB instead of MySQL, Nginx, and Apache, and everything that you might want if you are a PHP developer in there. So the customer gets a full set of features and doesn't have to install that themselves or care about it. That update thing again. It's a managed platform that uh, combines the power of a managed platform with root access. So configuration-wise, the customers can do whatever they want, but we take care of all the software in an automated fashion. Okay, customers get either a virtual pro server, this is a jail instance, or they can run a dedicated pro server, which is a virtual instance jail host, and they can put as many jails on that as they desire. And for us, it's all the same technology, so it's easily manageable. Our current virtual pro server host is all SSD-based, all ZFS, of course, 256 gigs of RAM, 20 cores, 40 threads, 
And currently we have one machine with 50 jails and it's just twiddling. Could do more. So how do we manage this zoo, actually? Well, it's, it's, the, the stack has grown quite big. Uh, the jail is, of course, the most important element of abstraction here. And we have looked into jail managers. There has been easy jail and free BSD pretty early. Then there was the warden uh, jail management tool, which is part of FreeNAS, still in FreeNAS 11. And the new FreeNAS jail manager, which is called IOCage, currently rewritten in Python. And we are uh, helping a little bit and are actively involved in the development of that Python IOCage by Brandon Schneider. It's a great tool. And if you like, check out the GitHub page. Um, these things are supposed to help management of jails. So how do they do this? All of these, I'm not quite sure about easy jail, but Warden and IOCage have the concept of a template jail. So you create a jail with a certain FreeBSD distribution, say 11.1, .1, and you install all the software you need, PHP, MySQL, all the same stuff again, into the template jail, and then you want to actually do something with it. So you instantiate it for a certain customer or a certain application, and by default, in Warden as well as in IOCage, this happens this way. You create a snapshot of the ZFS data set that contains the template jail, and then you clone the snapshot. Problem, these are copy on write clones of a ZFS snapshot, and ZFS snapshot is immutable. So again, we're facing this, one does not simply update. How, how am I going to update these things? What I as an operator want is not three instances that I all need to address separately. I want to update this, which I can do, but it won't propagate into these instances because these instances depend on the snapshot. Okay, questions so far? Good, so what we came up with is something we call blueprint jails. Uh, we made up the term blueprint jail for that because template is already a keyword in, in IO cage and we wanted to avoid a confusion. Says so in my first sentence, it is not IO cage templates. We just create a regular jail with a free BSD release, install all the software that we need. Um, the packages come from our own Poudrier and all of this is automatically done with Ansible. And after initial creation, we shut down the template jail and never touch it again. And then we come to an instance jail. An instance jail for a customer application is an empty jail in IOCage. IOCage can do that. And then we mount the blueprint jail on top read-only with nullfs. That's a local uh, mount that preserves the full POSIX file system semantics. And all the read-write directories that a customer's application might need, slash etc and so on, are separate ZFS data sets that we mount read-write on top of that. Yeah, all the ZFS mount points are set to legacy and IOCage has got uh, an FSTub feature by which it automatically mounts a certain set of directories and file system at jail startup. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so the file system layout is like this, we have an empty base jail. This instance is vpro0048, that's just the pro server product uh, that we manage at this point. Then we mount our template jail on top. The template jails are the blueprint jails. Blueprint jails are named 
like uh, the quarter of the parts collection that we use, which PHP version is in there, which Elasticsearch version is in there, so we can have different configuration uh, that we apply to different customer jails. And then we mount all the writable directories on top of that. And uh, this mount is a nullfs mount, and it's read-only. And the other mount are standard ZFS mounts, and they are read-write. The FS tab looks like this. I shortened it a bit so I could use a larger font, and I'm not quite sure if FS tab would accept continuation markers, but you get the idea what I'm trying to express here. Um, we have uh, some interesting things. This is one of the, on one of the big machines with uh, shared or virtual pro server products. So we have up to 50 currently um, instances of the JLs on this thing. So you can see that we have for the read write mounts, we have one Z pool here that is called Z data. This is a rate Z2. And we have another one that is Z root, that is a mirror. And all these database directories here, this is vardb, MySQL, are specifically tuned for database operations. So the block size is different, the metadata cache is different, and, and that stuff. And another thing, you have the um, blueprint jail read-only mount on the very top. And then we mount, for example, the ETC and uh, the user local ETC read-write on top of that. And then again, we mount the rc.d directory, for example, read only on top of that one. So the customer always gets the startup scripts that match the packages that are installed. So we do this for startup scripts and for the package database. So package info inside the customer's jails gives a consistent output and everything works. No. Our customers choose this product because they don't want to. We do it. Okay, provisioning of the entire system works like this. The pro server host is installed via Pixie Boot. We have uh, managed to get this completely unattended, including ZFS and everything, up to a point where you can manage the system with Ansible. The first uh, version of that uh, installed chef.io client and registered at the chef server. We've switched to Ansible for various reasons and we can uh, install the hardware completely automatically. The blueprint jail is installed with Ansible using the packages from our Poudriere. And uh, the instance jail is uh, again provisioned with Ansible. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about that. So, how do, how do we update a customer's instance now? The, the great thing about jails is that a jail need not be running to um, accesses from the host system and even to do things inside the jail. I cannot point this out uh, intensively enough to, to people who are not familiar with FreeBSD. It's just um, an, an incredible feature, in my opinion. So the, the jail is just a file system tree that's lying somewhere on your hard disk. And if you have a working resolve.conf inside the jail, the jail need not be running. You can just change root into it, use the host networking, and do a package upgrade. And I don't know any other container technology that would do this. Uh, well, we don't do that. <laughs> uh, why? Uh, because of that buzzword here, immutable infrastructure. <laughs> That's one of those rollback things. So uh, once the Blueprint jails are created and provisioned, we don't change them again. But if we want to do updates, we create a new one. And then we update all the instances that depend on them because we just have to iterate over all the customer jails, shut down, change mount points, boot. That takes about 30 seconds. So customer gets 30 second interruption of service and has all the latest security fixes.
Okay, backups. We have ZFS. Easy, we do snapshots, you can do them hourly, you can do them daily. There's the SysUtil uh, ZFS tools port that contains a ZFS auto snapshot utility that you can run from cron. And you just tell it how many snapshots you want to retain and it works similarly to Time Machine. So you can say, okay, hourly for 24 hours, daily for seven days, weekly for one month and, and everything. And you have all those snapshots so on the local system the backup for help, I need to r roll back something I did to my application. Uh, that case of restore is solved. And uh, for disaster recovery, we copy these snapshots to a different system, to a larger backup server with just lots of storage. Uh, we plan to have one of those per rack to have them physically near and have faster network connections and uh, distribute the load a bit. I found a tool on GitHub that is called ZFS Backup from Solaris. It hasn't been updated for two or three years or so, but it works quite well. It's a shell script. I liked it. We have built a port out of that, but that still needs a little bit of polishing because before I can submit it for inclusion in the port stream. But I will do it, promise. <laughs> works, works for us now, so. So, this, this was the overview of, of our architecture and how we run our hosting. So, uh, after we tackled some of the problems we have, what's, what's, left, what's left open and what's left to do? Um, we essentially replaced the VM stuff that is difficult to manage with jails, and we developed the tools that make them easy to manage. What we, of course, would like to have is some sort of central storage for all of this. Central distributed, I'm not quite sure, without introducing a new single point of failure. And I, plan I submitted a birds of a feather session that is starting after this talk, all the way upstairs. And I would love if anyone interested in high availability storage on FreeBSD would just come to discuss concepts and everything. I must admit that I don't have a plan or ready to go solution, <laughs> but I have some ideas and I'd just like to discuss it. See, in just a sec. So another point uh, would be if we could offer self-provisioning of customers. So uh, like a true cloud solution, they could just click and get their jail instance uh, specified to their needs. That would be nice. And it would essentially give us a private cloud solution. Uh, we are planning to go that way slowly, given the resources we have with four people. But first thing we want to implement is an API for all that Ansible code we have, possibly REST, possibly something different. And uh, when the API is done, then the front end can be uh, implemented by anyone. But um, as I learned today, possibly something like this already exists. There are some people at the booth upstairs from, oh, well, that was a different, difficult name. Uh, Xtinfinity, and they claim to have a complete OpenStack-like private cloud infrastructure based on FreeBSD. And I'm definitely going to check that out. And I mean OpenStack-like, not OpenStack-compatible or anything, so they're doing everything on ZFS, jails, and they say they have a control panel, they have distributed storage, and I'm really curious how far ahead of us they are, or if they are essentially not so much far ahead. I don't know. I really don't have a clue at the moment. So now for that one. Yeah. We use the resource limits that uh, were implemented for jails not so long ago and we apply them again with Ansible. As... Um, okay. 
Okay, so the question was, how do we control resources? Do we give every customer all the 20 cores and all the 40 threads? I said, no, we, we just uh, use the resource limits, limits which I, our experience shows that for CPU cores, they work quite well. For memory, not so much. And I have to look a little bit deeper into this, how it's actually implemented and how it works, because I figure it might be a hard problem to do something like this with jail technology. Any clue, Kirk, how is it, how it is done? Resource limits for jails? <laughs> All right, so now uh, there was a few comments in the room that uh, what you've uh, done is re-implemented uh, some of the easy jail features into IOCage. Uh, have you done it in such a way that you could commit this upstream to IO Cage to so that IO Cage can, Cage can catch up with EasyJail on this front? Uh, well, we uh, uh, sent all our changes to IO Cage to Brenton for inclusion, which he did, but we're actually not really uh, implementing EasyJail in IO Cage. We just create a custom FS tab for IO Cage to use to, as I now learned, re-implement something similar to EasyJail. So actually, there is nothing to open source. If you if you take the current I/O cage and give it an FS tab file like the one I showed you, there you go. Um, question from me: uh, When we investigated jail management, which uh, was well quite quite some time ago, it looked like Easy Jail was more or less a dead end project, and. <laughs> Then IX system started to sponsor re-implementation of IO cage, so that's why we put our bets on that. So when when did EasyJail wake up again and get <laughs> So the honest answer is I think there's still uh, ongoing effort in FreeBSD to revamp the way that you run and configure jails. And this is not a done thing. So uh, that's where, where you're stuck as well, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Uh. And one last thing. Uh, FreeBSD used jail.conf and EasyJail doesn't support that. There were a, a set of patches to, to work with that, but it, they were never committed. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have two questions. First of all, uh, those uh, resource control things, do they uh, cause any trouble with Java? Because I knew those existed because Java assumes that you are running like you have 200 gigas, but you, you, you actually have like two and it, and it causes problems when it tries to allocate at all, you know. And the second thing, have you considered uh, using uh, UnionFS for uh, defaults and let users uh, alter their configuration if they want to? Thanks. Okay, so, uh, second question first. I've po pointed out at another occasion that as an operator, I want UnionFS like semantics instead of copy on write clones. So I understand your question. Uh, the fact is that currently UnionFS is simply broken and not being worked upon much, as far as I get it. And uh, it seems to be a problem that is not at all easy to solve for the general case because of what happens when you delete things in the upper layers and how they are propagated down. So possibly this uh, will never see the day of light, the light of day. <laughs> So um, first question, yes, that's why I made that remark about memory management and resource limits. As I said, it works really well for a CPU cores, uh, but we had Java processes run astray and consume definitely more memory than they were entitled to. And we had to fix this on the application level. Just contact the customer and politely tell them to limit their Elasticsearch memory and stuff like that. So, uh, two things. First one is, um, you might not be aware that I think Steve Wills is working on a port of the now open sourced Ansible Tower or AWX to FreeBSD, and that would provide you with a REST API to put your AI UI sugar on top. 
so that's probably worth a look. Um, the other question is how do you deal with things like um, slash dev slash log in um, your jails? Uh, and yeah, that one first. Well, since uh, the finished product is a managed root server, all the jails have their own private logging because the customer is root, with the exception that he cannot install his own software, which we manage for him, which is what uh, people seem to appreciate. So that's the dev log thing. We haven't looked into tower yet, uh, if you're interested. We started our data center, data center automation with chef.io, and we ran a one quarter long project where we very, very intensively worked with developers and operators and implemented a really huge, now I must admit, uh, over-engineered system of managing chef recipes and cookbooks. We had unit tests, we had integration tests, we had server spec tests, we provisioned them and pushed them into the chef's server with Jenkins, and then finally loaded them down to the managed hosts. Then we had this version pinning thing with a Berks file and everything you can imagine, and it was just definitely over-engineered. So now with Ansible, we uh, go with a more lean approach. There are actually still hard-coded constants, things that apply only to our data center. So it doesn't make sense to open source that part because nobody else would uh, be able to work with us together on the project. I'm very willing and we're very open to share anything we actually created as far as knowledge is concerned. Uh, and our approach to the Ansible stuff is that we are continuously refactoring the entire thing every couple of months anyway. Uh, so it will probably never be a finished product or something that is usable in the general case. How do you deal with uh, the security risks of uh, accessing data, data and things within a jail from outside the jail? For example, if you have a sim link inside the jail and you look at it from outside and, it point it's, and it's absolute, then it points to something else. We use IO cage console to change into the jail most of the time. Okay. <laughs> and when, when we don't, we hopefully know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. How? So, what benefits does this um, give you to access the jails from the outside? It's a bit of a trick question because we're doing the same ourselves. But I would like to hear your ideas first. <laughs> <laughs> um, to to me, it's not so much accessing jails from the outside. It's the fact that it's actually local file system modes. So you can share, for example, the same file system or data set among multiple jails, and all of them have local semantics. So you can have a Unix domain socket on them, like mysql.soc or phpfpm.soc. So you can isolate the database, the web server, the phpfpm. You can have two jails running different versions of PHP FPM and both have mounted the same customer files and PHP applications data set. So the customer can try his application with different versions of PHP and all that stuff. The single um, opportunity where I really go into a jail and access it from the outside is, as I said, when I want to do updates or a quick modification, add a package that will, of course, later go back into the Ansible code. Uh, but if I need to manually add a package to one of our Blueprint jails, and the Blueprint jails is, of course, not running while it's mounted into all those customer instances, then I can just change root into it and package install something. I could even use, without the change root, package install and give it a destination path and everything. So that's about the only application we have. But the general architecture is local file system mounts beat everything, in my opinion. And you can do so many fancy things with that that I don't want to miss it. Now, what are you doing with them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, forgot that one. Of course, we run uh, the stock security scripts and daily scripts as well as our own ones only on the host system and not in the jails. I 
I also use Ansible and, and Jails, specifically EasyJail and, and um, uh, IOCage. I like the idea that you're putting the local system data on separate file sets. I like that idea because I like ZFS and I like to put anything that you may ever want to use separately in a different data set. And I'm tempted to do that for my own jails at home, which I'm updating myself. Uh, I, I also like the approach of never updating in place, but just creating a new jail. And I may wind up doing that, uh, say for Postgres. I have a PG01 jail, which hosts use at the moment. And instead of upgrading that in place, I may create PG02, update everything in there, and then just swap everything over. Um, that's not great for high availability because there's going to be downtime, but hey, it, it's at home. But a few good ideas on what you gave me there. No questions, just thanks. Great. Glad you liked it. Um, do you have any idea how much time you're saving now during updates? Because now you just have to shut them down, flip that path, and bring them back up. Is it saving you time already? Yes, definitely. I, I can't tell you how much time or money precisely, but definitely. Up, updating those NanoBSD servers, despite the fact that it was sort of atomic and NanoBSD and everything was always a, a hassle and we dreaded the, the update days, and we've changed to a monthly schedule of doing updates, whether there are security updates or not. We just do it monthly to keep our customer base educated, sort of. And in case of an emergency, of course, we do them right away. And we don't have a problem to update all the systems. We do it in you know, two, three hours. All the jail-based ones, that is. Yes, yes, yes. The, the interruption per jail is in the order of 30 seconds to a minute or even less, depending on the, the amount of services the customers are running and how, how much time they need to, to write out their volatile data and, and everything. So we've used um, HA proxy to put um, stuff behind and actually end up with seamless updates as a result. So we have a, like an, an active jail that's performing service. We have the new upgraded one in place ready to go and then um, just set the, the, the back end of HA proxy for the old jail to um, maintenance, and then it just automatically traffic just switches over to the new one. And I don't know if that works for your customers, but certainly for us that makes upgrades embarrassingly easy. Um, so much that we have our databases behind it now, um, our message cube behind it, our APIs to external, uh, so third party APIs as well, and it's really, really nice. So you're doing this for centralized services, like a centralized database server or a couple of them, and centralized message queue server or a couple of them, not one instance per customer? Or is it one? Well, <laughs> yeah, so we're not a hosted service. We, it's a, um, we, yeah, we're running our own business, and... Um, we have multiple databases, clustered databases, clusters message queue, and they are accessed from HA proxy. So it looks like one externally, but we have them on multiple nodes. Um, so for example, the, this jail host here receives traffic to its local um, database, unless that's down for maintenance, in which case it just goes to the nearest one. Yeah. 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 That's, that's definitely the way to go. Um, we, we don't do it for these customer jails because we have a plethora of independent customers who all run their completely independent instance with a full stack. So that wouldn't scale too well. We have not found a way to do that yet. Hi. Uh, no problem. Um, what, uh, what happens if a customer is not okay with a downtime of 30 seconds? What do you do then? Or is it just your business model just saying this is how it's done and you have to accept it? Uh, he can book... Uh, Jail, an additional jail that is not built as highly because it's inactive most of the time, come up with his agency who does the software for him or with us with a replication mechanism and then we switch over to the inactive one, update the active one, there you go. 
or have uh, two jails the same size and simply switch over, of course. Okay, so no, no question. If you made that uh, presentation two months ago, I would tell you that you were wrong about the search root command. But now Solaris is dead, you are, you are right. <laughs> okay, one, one more over here. Uh, since you managed the failover situation where you have a separate jail where you replicate and stuff, how do you handle uh, host updates, uh, physical machines? Do you have the same mechanism somehow or do you say it's part of the business model? The, the host runs very few applications on its own, so it's mostly the base uh, operating system, and uh, we schedule a maintenance window and inform the customers in that case. Uh, for several of them who have uh, contracts that uh, match that, we actually switch to jails on a different host, but not for all of them. Okay, thank you. <laughs>